Thank you, Patrick. Hi, everybody. This is Alex, our last show of April. And um, the fools have been practicing here. We're, we've got, we're all ready for a show tonight. Uh, we've got Steve Miller. Steve Miller is going to tell us about how to take images with a DOM. And you may think, well, how many people do that? No, not many people do that. But you can learn a lot from them that do. Because uh, in order to get that to work, you got to understand a lot about what's going on in your imaging, about how the Earth moves, how the stars move, about how you can take advantage of that with changing your timing and your and all that stuff. And I'm not going to tell you everything Steve's going to tell you because I don't know yet. But he's going to be here in just a moment. So let me share some screen with you here, and I'm going to tell you about what's coming up. We're pretty good all the way up until June 18th. I think we've got the full cast of characters coming. And some of them are our greatest hits people. We haven't seen them in a while. So I should be presenting my screen right now. And here we go, down to the uh, calendar. Whoops, I've already gotten ahead of us. Uh, Steve's here tonight. Russ Croman is bringing in some a whole lot of stuff. He's gonna tell us about artificially powered deconvolution. Russ has actually changed um, a lot of image processing particularly for those who have been using his blur exterminator, his noise exterminator, uh, his uh, everything. I mean, he's really changed, made it a lot of things that we used to have to think about a lot easier to do. Warren's coming back. Um, Warren hasn't told me what he's talking about yet, nor has uh, Ron, although they're both coming back. I should coordinate with those two guys so that they don't talk about the same thing. But anyway, uh, Randall in the middle, He's going to be, it's really cool. He's going to tell us, one of our favorite topics, generally speaking, is about um, how you should be beginning out, you know, how you should start out. Um, a lot of us make a lot of mistakes, and hopefully after hearing from Randall, uh, we're going to um, we're going to find out a few things that you should do when you're just beginning. Uh, and we want some of you veteran people around too, because you can you can put comments over in the side when you're, when you're going along there, and you know, like you're doing over here right now. See all these comments? Well, there's a whole lot. And and you can you can say, hey, yeah, that's good advice. Or, hey, I also found out that this was important. And you can do all sorts of other things. And then on June 4th, we're going to have our TAIC team present a couple of tutorials for you. I'm doing one about um, uh, off-axis guider. And we're also going to be doing something about imaging with the Mac. Uh, but we're also going to go through how the year has been, what we've done, what we haven't done that we've tried to do and haven't gotten done yet. Now we've got some other people coming in. There's June 18th. That's bugging me because it's still not filled. We've got some other people coming up. Um, some of the people I picked up from Neep and NIAC. So we'll be enjoying that. At any rate, that's what we've got planned. Now, Steve has been here with us and Steve uh, has been practicing and uh, he's all ready to go. So I am going to turn this over to Steve Miller, who has been imaging with the DOB and wants to tell us how it's best done. Steve, take it away. There you go. Let me know if it's showing. You look good. All right. Uh, thank you. Now it's, yeah, my name is Stephen Miller. I'm here in Vancouver, Washington, in the United States. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about how you can do some deep sky astrophotography with a telescope that no one thought could do this. It's a stock go-to Dobsonian. These telescopes are offered by Orion and Skywatcher. They're for visual use. They're essentially a Dobsonian that has a couple motors to help it track the sky so that when you get an object in there, like looking at Jupiter, it will tr basically track it, at least good enough so that if you're at a star party or you have friends over, they can look through it and you don't have to always worry about nudging the scope because the object will stay in the eyepiece. Well, that basically technology, uh, that simple uh, um, capability really is what enables these to do deep sky. And there's some technology advancements that happened over the last few years that, that really opened the door for that. So I want to talk, talk to that. So a little bit about me. So I'm a native Pacific Northwesterner here, uh, grew up in Oregon. I study electrical engineering and computer science at Oregon State. And then I became, went and worked at, as an engineer for Hewlett Packard for 33 years. I've been retired for about five years now. Uh, my focus during my time at Hewlett Packard was imaging science, uh, doing both so software and hardware imaging architectures for printing pipelines, including image enhancement algorithms and color matching, half toning, compression. So I do have a, quite a bit of background in imaging, and I was always a Photoshop expert and so forth, and have you know my 
algorithms that I developed. But uh, but I never did anything outside of work, outside, imaging outside of work at the time, because work kind of scratched that itch. Um, but I had always been low uh, science, nature, astronomy, and computers. Um, my interest, I'm kind of a generalist. Um, because work uh, did so much technical work, outside of work, I, I was into kind of more physical activities. I liked windsurfing, uh, mountain climbing. Uh, that's my daughter and me. Uh, she packs my snowboards up now to the top of the mountains when we do, uh, when we climb the snowboard down. So since I'm getting older, uh, fishing down at the Oregon coast, scuba diving and uh, fossil hunting at the Oregon coast when there's storms down there, washes fossils in and that's kind of fun to find. So kind of an outdoor guy, but I've always wanted a technical hobby when I retired and I thought astronomy would be the one to do. So um, my background in astronomy though was uh, a little bit, uh, you know, a family bought a little Tasco refractor when we were kids. As an adult, I bought a used small Schmidt Cassegrain telescope that we'd put on the deck and we'd look at the moon and look at Jupiter with it, just basic stuff. Um, I had a film camera and when like Hale Bopp came around, I did go out there and take a couple of snapshots of it. Uh, so I was always kind of had a little bit of interest and I didn't want a technical hobby uh, when I retired, certainly basically astronomy. I thought about astrophotography, but the problem is, is I wasn't sure where and how to do it. You know, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. I have lots of clouds and rain. My yard is full of trees. So there's trees to the east, trees to the south, trees to the west. I can see up in the sky, but it's so blocked. There's no place to put up anything that really is permanent, certainly. And, uh, and then we have, you know, in addition to the clouds and rain, we get a lot of fire smoke and in the fall when it's normally dry and clear out. And on the right there, you see some picture of that, what it can be looking like. So what I decided to get was a, an Orion Dobsonian because it would be really good for planet and lunar viewing. And occasionally we did visit dark sky locations where I visit family and they live in very dark sky locations. I thought I could bring it with me. We can do some family viewing of the deep sky objects and, and just go from there. And I kept it in the garage and we just dolly it out and set it up on a piece of plywood and, and do basic viewing uh, at home. So how do I get into astrophotography with this? So I never considered that my dog could do, uh, capture much of a picture. Um, the problem is that tracking, even though it does track an object, it's really mediocre. It drifts off target fairly quickly, okay? And the tracking isn't smooth, it's kind of jerky, okay? And then you've heard all about field rotation. What that is essentially when you're looking at an object in the sky, it essentially rotates as it goes, rises and sets. And you need a, um, a astrophotography rig that rotates with it. That's why people use those equatorial mounts, okay? And this didn't do that. And they, you know, and historically you need guiding and, and then this telescope's a long focal length telescope. It really zooms in. Well, that's not a good place to start when you're doing astrophotography. I had a few early attempts trying to put a DLSR up to it through eyepiece projection, that failed. Um, I couldn't get my Canon Rebel to come to focus on it because uh, it, the back focus isn't good enough. In other words, I can't rack the focuser in enough to get it to focus on the, with that camera. So I kind of gave up on that. Um, so I just resigned myself to taking quick snapshots with my iPhone. So I put the iPhone up and I just kind of try to get a snapshot, you know, obviously not very good pictures, but you know, that's all I could do. So the next thing that happened was that I saw some decent planetary pictures someone had done on cloudy nights with a scope much like mine. And so I reached out to them and found out that essentially, yes, you could. If you get a planetary camera, it does track good enough for planetary because you're taking such high frame rates. It doesn't matter that it's kind of jerky. It kind of drifts. So I bought a kind of planetary camera, an ASI 45MC for 400 bucks. It was kind of a little bit larger for a planetary camera as far as the sensor size. And I heard that that was good because uh, it's good bang for the buck. It's good if you're gonna do lunar, it captures more area. And also when the target's drifting, it's less likely to drift off the sensor. I borrowed my daughter's 12 year old laptop and then got it going. Watched a couple of videos on fire capture and auto stacker. And I got some initially good pictures. I mean, I, for me, not ever taking an astro picture, these were very satisfying to get. Basic pictures of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Venus. So that was pretty exciting right there. Um, and then the larger camera was good. For instance, here with Jupiter, with the moons were pretty far away from the planet, but with the larger sensor camera, you can still capture the entire scene. So that's kind of neat. So then I also brought into doing the lunar, uh, some lunar pictures. I built a little solar filter mask. Essentially, it's that solar film that blocks like 99.99% .99 of the light, lets a little bit of light in, and then you can do some solar, uh, white light solar imaging. So you can take pictures of sunspots. So that was also pretty fun to do. So. 
This scope can easily do any of these. That's not a stretch for this type of telescope. But what do I do next? So here I am, I'm out there. I'm actually taking a picture of Venus as it's still kind of a little bit daylight. I've got that little camera in there. I got my daughter's laptop set up and uh, I got the, it sitting on a piece of plywood in the lawn. Um, so I did upgrade my system. My daughter's laptop was too slow, even for planetary. So I got a gaming laptop, an eight core with SSD. Um, but the problem is that it was, this was last May. It wasn't planet season anymore. The moon wasn't up and there were no sunspots visible. And I was kind of bored. I wanted to shoot something with my telescope. And I thought to myself, what if I pointed this to the couple of the bright deep sky objects like the Whirlpool Galaxy or the M13 Glob Cluster? I could find those even in my light polluted backyard. I could find those and maybe I could take a picture. So I asked Cloudy Nights, went on Cloudy Nights, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. How, how should I do this? And I got a wide range of answers. The most common was you can't do it or get a refractor extra amount. Why are you trying to do it with that telescope? I generally got, you're going to be sorry, you know, if you try to do that. I did get a couple more positive answers. One person said, you have the camera, go for it. What do you have to lose? You know, and then the one person actually gave me some tips saying, you know, they've done a bit of it, just shoot very short exposures and you'll be fine. You know, whatever your telescope can support with tracking, just lower the exposure down to that level and then live with it. So I did, I tried, I went out there, I used fire capture and I would put the, the images through deep sky stacker and I only did it for a few minutes. And so here were the first shots. So the first night was encouraging. I got M51, I just took 25 exposures. They're only 15 seconds. It, it's not a great picture, but for me, it was like, wow, I got something. And then here's M13. It was, uh, I shortened the exposures a little bit because the stars were really big and blobby on M51. So it was maybe a little bit better, but for me, that was kind of cool. Just put my planetary camera in there, going out for, you know, what, 10 minutes, five minutes and, and getting these pictures. So uh, I was worried that I was using way too of a short of an exposure time. Everyone's telling me, you know, those, that level of exposure time is way too short. You're never gonna get a good picture. I watched a video that really helped. It was from uh, Mr. Sharpcap, Dr. Robin Glover. Uh, Glover has a video on YouTube, you can find it. And on what's, and what's kind of a reasonable minimum exposure time based on modern CMOS cameras. And he basically has a lot of math and a lot of tables. And, but what he basically explains is that with modern CMOS cameras, the read noise from the camera is so low that you can actually take some fairly short exposures. And so I did the math on my, with my camera. So I looked up his table over here and it says, you know, if you're in Bortle Seven Skies, you can, and you, uh, you have an F5 telescope, you start with uh, in a color, in a uh, mono camera, it's a 4.4 seconds you can start with, but then you can do a bunch of modifications based on your camera. So you look up your own read noise of your camera, which I have over here on the right. And then I basically did some math, you know, you, I'm an F5 telescope, Bortle Seven, that's 4.4 seconds. He says you have to multiply by that by three for a color camera, so I'm up to 13 seconds. And then uh, you modify it based on the read noise of your camera, which my read noise is lower than, than his you know, benchmark he used, so I'm down to three seconds. And then you modify it by your quantum efficiency and your pixel size, now I'm up to 3.4 seconds. So basically it says that if I want to keep the read noise of the camera down below a very low threshold, below 5%, the total amount of noise in my image, I need it to be longer than 3.4 seconds. And I thought, wow, that was a lot shorter than I ever expected to, to be. 3.4 seconds, really? So what happens if you go longer or shorter than that with this camera in this situation? So here is his charts, just generally, you know, what it looks like when you, uh, when you go longer and shorter compared to his recommended sub-exposure length. So here's a very long exposure, gets to this level of noise. And what that means is that all the noise that's left is the light pollution noise, which you, you, know, you have to get rid of with other means by taking, you know, using a lot of time. The noise above that green line is the camera read noise. That's the noise that you get when you take too short of exposure. So with my exposures at 3.4 seconds, you can see I only add a little bit of extra noise above that green line. If I go down to 1.7, down to 0.8, then it starts getting big, but that's super short exposures. If I go up to 6.8 or 14 seconds, I don't gain that much. So it says, that's why he says, you know, 3.4 in my camera, not a bad place to, to start. So I felt pretty good then that I, you know, was in a pretty good spot. Um, with that, I'm just gonna pause for questions if there are any questions about so far. Uh, Steve, not so far. That's fine. And by the way, if you ask us if there are questions, 
we desperately reach for our mouse to unmute ourselves. So oh, okay. give us a moment. I will. None so far. Okay. All right. So short exposures were not my problem. My problem was this. I live in a fairly light polluted area. I can't even see most D sky targets, even some of the major ones, um, let alone centering them, framing them, staying on target. I did those first two targets just because they're so darn bright, I can see them in my telescope. But I went out and I tried to find the pinwheel galaxy and two nights in a row, I failed. In fact, the second night I thought I had it, I ended up taking some pictures and all I got was this uh, other galaxy, a small, because I saw this smudge and I thought it was the galaxy. And so I kind of realized, man, I'm gonna be kind of stuck here because a lot of these things I just can't even see. Uh, so I thought perhaps I wasn't gonna be able to do this after all, really. And then I met someone on Cloudy Nights, Ken Bressard, he, uh, that's his Cloudy Nights uh, um, login. Or, but uh, he, he's, I crawled back to Cloudy Nights and confessed that I failed and what should I do? And he wrote out and he said, just connect the telescope to Nina, you know, the software that drives telescopes, which I didn't know it could drive my telescope. Use the Celestron driver. What? I'm on an Orion telescope. He tells me to go use this, go get the Celestron driver, download that. All right. Uh, then download the plate solver and then Nina will plate solve for you. Basically take a picture of the sky. He'll tell you where you are. And then Nina will automatically pseudo the target and correctly center you right on the target, even if you can't see it. And then you can write a script. It'll keep the target centered for hours and take your pictures for you. So it seemed too good to be true until I tried it and it immediately worked. It was amazing. So I just started anything that came up, I started shooting you know, with this little planetary camera. And I was getting some better at taking the pictures too. And so I started to get better results. I was, it, was, it was pretty exciting to get these kind of pictures just with this little planetary camera you know, within the first like two weeks of, uh, you know, giving this a try. So, and then also one benefit of a big fast scope like a Dobsonian is it is fairly productive on smaller targets. I mean, it's a big scope, so it has a long, long um, focal length. So it kind of zooms in, but a lot of targets out there aren't giant. And so when, if it does fit in the field of view, you can get a, an okay image in a fairly short period of time. And I'm in Bortal 7 skies, so fairly light polluted skies. So. So that, that was kind of nice because I can go out there and don't have to spend that long, come back and, and you know, get kind of a fun image. So by the fall of 2022, by about three months, I kind of upgraded my, my set of my equipment. Um, I got a new camera. I got an ASI 183MC. It's not a deep sky camera, but I was doing a lot of lunar and solar work. And I wanted a camera with a little bit larger sensor and a high pixel count. And I also had access to my daughter's full frame Nikon Z6. Now it turns out, uh, uh, mirrorless cameras have the sensor mounted so close to the front of the camera that they can pretty much come to focus on any scope. If you can mount it to your telescope, you could probably come to focus. And I could focus with that, that camera. And so I started using that camera as my deep sky camera as a, in addition to that 183. And then I talked about the laptop. Well, I upgraded it. I added more RAM. I added more, uh, um, a larger SSD because this deep sky stuff takes a lot of space, especially with these short exposures. And then here was a big upgrade for me. I went from deep sky stacker to astro pixel processor. What happened was I noticed that sometimes the field of view was so small in my camera and my short exposures that deep sky stacker didn't always see enough stars to align the frames and get them all uh, stacked together. Astro pixel processor was really robust in doing that and it produced a, a better quality results. And then I also just got better at operating my telescope, basic operation like I tuned up my ability to doing my two star alignment. I wasn't, I really wasn't doing it right. I basically wasn't following the manual. And uh, turns out, you know, if, you, if you're centering your star, you always center it using the same up and to the right button so that you take out the backlash of the telescope correctly. If you do it the same with each star, then it's more likely to have an accurate alignment and track better. So I started getting better tracking. And then I also added a Batnoff mask, which is you put in the front of the telescope. It makes the stars have these spikes. And if you adjust the focus so that that center spike is right between the others, then you know you've got decent focus. And then finally, I started taking flats, which is essentially you put a, uh, you put something that has a really flat light in front of your telescope, either taking a picture of the sky or a t-shirt of the telescope. I used a little tracing panel and flats basically correct for some of the optical um, deficiencies in your, in your system and help uh, make the pictures look better. So my typical setup was if I was just doing observing, I would just have my battery pack and I had the scope power from that and I had a little mirror fan. 
uh, on the back. And I always had that so it cooled the scope down a little faster. Then if I was doing some basic astrophotography, I would just have a USB connecting to the camera and my laptop on a little um, card table. If I wanted to control the scope also, because I'm doing something a little more sophisticated with Nina, then I'd have a USB cable to the controller. And if it's a cooled camera, you know, which I didn't, which I get later, you know, you need to cool it and it has to have its own little power source. So that connects to the battery also. And if I was doing an all night session, which I'll talk about later, then I basically bring an extension cord out because I need to power the laptop off that. I can't run off battery all night. And I actually have a little heater, it's a little deck heater, infrared heater that I put on a ladder and I set it about eight feet away from my setup behind the scope. And it kind of just gives a little bit of heat to the area because I have a lot of dew in my area. And this just kind of keeps the dew away in general. The whole kind of area just kind of keeps dew free, which is kind of nice. So how far can you take this stuff? So imaging, I mean, what can you do? So, because I was warned that even though I got a few basic images, Dylan and Cloudy Nights are saying, you, you know, you're, they look at the little defects, like I had coma and I had, you know, the stars were a little oblong. One person said, your problems are many, starting with an ambition that exceeds the ability of your equipment. <laughs> so definitely I was being warned, stop doing this. <laughs> but I, I kind of took it as a challenge. And so I got three enormous equipment upgrades. The first thing I did is I actually bought a large cooled camera. ASI 2600 MC. It costs as much as a telescope. <laughs> it had, but I, my experience with my daughter's camera was so positive, but the regular land cameras or, you know, DLSRs, they have various limitations for astrophotography, and I wanted to get past those, including the, the sensitivity to certain light that's important, and also it was just cumbersome to use, all the physical buttons. So I bought this camera, a lot larger field of view. Then here's another one. I got a, a, a coma corrector for the telescope that's also a reducer. So it actually makes the telescope instead of f4.9, f3.7, which means it has almost 80% larger field of view. And what's neat is that people at Star Arizona that make the Nexus, they started making a version without the collar so that the entire um, coma corrector can fit in the focuser. And this allows you to use it with telescopes that don't have a lot of back focus. So it, this easily works with my job. And when I contacted them, they didn't have it on their website. They said, oh, we make these in special batches. We're finding a lot of people have, do, you know, have uh, Newtonians with not enough back focus. And they were starting to sell a lot of these. So uh, apparently there's, there's people out there that are doing something like I'm doing. I just don't know who they are. And then I got a, a dual band, narrow band filter. I'm in light blue skies. I want to shoot some of these uh, dimmer nebula that are emission nebula. This cuts out essentially 94% of the um, light pollution, and it only lets these two narrow bands through, the oxygen and hydrogen alpha. That's kind of the blue-green and the red that you see from emission nebula. And so then I started going on a shooting spree and just kind of going around, anything popped up. Um, a couple of these are from dark sky locations when I visited family. Most of these are from the backyard. Um, and, uh, you know, most of these are done in, a, in an hour or two. Um, a couple of these I took four hours of time to do, but... Um, Anyway, and so for me, this was beyond what I thought this job would be able to do. And, uh, and it was those three upgrades that really enabled it. I'm going to pause again for questions. I'll give you a chance to unmute. I have a question, Steve. So if you're going for a half hour or hour, you got a bit of field rotation in that. Now, is that all taken care of with your star alignment or some other? I method? will get into that. I'm glad you asked that. That's coming up. Okay. Um, yeah. Also, another thing that may be coming up or not is uh, I don't know that you've mentioned just what your capabilities are in the uh, DAB itself. What the um, uh, is it equatorially mounted? Oh, uh, and yeah. all that. Yeah. So no, it's not. It is an it is a classic Dobsonian mount where it's on a lazy Susan that turns left and right, and then it goes up and down. So up and down, and left and right. So it's an alt as telescope, and it's it's similar to the push drop zones that you just push around. The okay. only difference is they put a motor on each axis, so it can kind of go up and down and left and right itself, but it, it's not an equatorial system. So I and, get field rotation, yes. Like and it's, it's got encoders on it, so it knows where it's pointed. That's right, it does. Okay. Yeah. That's that's not a Dob according to John Dobson, but okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, do Dobson's is a cannon mount. That's what he yeah. wants to have, it's a <laughs> yeah. cannon mount. But, uh, okay. So how is this Thank possible? You. So shooting for hours with an alt as that causes field rotation, okay? So how do I deal with that? How can I do exposures with narrowband filters? Narrowband filters means you have to do really long exposures. How, just, what, why would I do that? 
And then how can I do short exposures in a dark sky location? I've taken this to a Bortle 2 sky location in, in, and it's been successful. And then stacking is going to kill me. I mean, if I'm taking short exposures for three or four hours, uh, there's no way you can stack that many frames. It's going to take days. So how do I deal with these problems? These are real problems. So first one is field rotation. So um, what happens is, is that field rotation is because when I'm just pointing at the sky and I can only move down, up, down, and left and right, and the sky is actually moving to this, this arc, then essentially, according to my camera, it looks like the target is rotating. And if I take a long exposure, this is what it looks like. You know, in the center of the camera, it'll be okay. But as you move to the edge of the camera, everything's rotating around it. And so it causes this circular smearing. So that's one problem. The second problem is over a period of time, it rotates. So even if, you, you know, so the entire scene kind of rotates through the camera. It's almost like the camera's rotating on the sky. So you're taking different pictures of different parts of the sky. The center's okay, but all the edges of your camera are hitting different sections of the sky uh, around that area. And so you're not really being consistent. So how do you deal with that? So here's the solutions. So for short exposures, deals with field rotation smearing. If I take eight second exposures, that's usually fine. There's only a couple areas of sky where you wanna cut it down. And quite a few of the areas you could take longer with, with an APS-C size camera. The other one is good stacking software deals with rotation over a long session. A couple things happen. First, uh, PixInsight, APP, um, Serial can all stack into a larger frame. They will take a look at all those images and they say, well, gee, those are all rotating into this larger square. I'm just going to stack them all into this larger square. And then you can decide to crop it later if you want. And then the other thing is that they smooth all the seams, like especially APP is really good at the seams that you would think between these different rotated subs, since they're not aligned, you would think it'd create, you know, some type of um, artifact and it can't, but some of these stacking software are pretty good at, at removing that. And for me, Astro Pixel Processor was really the best performer of the four I've tried. So here's an example of field rotation with Nina recentering. So what you're gonna see is you're gonna see the Iris Nebula. This is from a Boral 2 location and I'm taking a picture of it. And I took actually a, 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 pan or a panel. So the Iris will be a little bit to the lower right in this case, but you'll see it kind of the field slowly rotating and you'll see it, the, the object drift. You see it drift off and then Nina pushes it back every once in a while. This is over like four hours. So this is just, you know, showing you real quick. But you can see the field rotating in the camera over time and then it, it's drifting to, a, to the lower right constantly but nina's constantly shoves it back every you know 15 minutes it has to kind of go whoop and when it's doing that it stops taking pictures it repositions the scope that takes about 20 seconds and then it starts taking pictures again so that's what it looks like uh over four hours so field rotation is the smearing and depending on where you are your latitude on the um planet and also where you're looking at the sky it can be better or worse Here's an example for me. If I'm taking eight second, ex second exposures and I'm at 45 degrees latitude approximately, and I use an APS-C type, type camera, the areas that I'm looking at in the sky here, this dome above me, everything in green here is fine. You're not gonna see any field rotation. And then, but if you get into the red, you'll start to see that smearing of that rotation in each frame you take, you know, each picture. And so if I was taking a, a picture of, an, of a target straight north and at, seven degrees altitude, I might have to cut it down to six seconds or something, you know, to, to escape it. But everywhere else I'd be, be in pretty good shape. So most of this guy is okay. Um, so here's an example of Astro Pix processor. I just want to make a plug for that because it really is, it was probably the best performer for this kind of data. Here's an example where I had some extremely difficult data and I, I made a few mistakes. I was taking a multi-panel of the Orion and Running Man Nebula. I didn't take very good flats. It was low in the sky, a lot of light pollution, and I had kind of some horrible drift. And so I had these, I had, uh, it's an extreme pressure test. And, uh, I, and I stacked it together as one shot instead of as a mosaic because these panels were highly overlapping. So you could stack it as just one pile of frames. So here's the problem. Was a full, I was using a full frame camera at the time plus a focal reducer. So I had a lot of vignetting, lots of drift and field rotation lots of frame overlap, and it was low in the sky, lots of light pollution. So when I put it into, uh, when I put it into Cyril, this is what it looked like, this mess. Look at this horrible mess stacked together. It stacked them, but look at the seams. It's just, <laughs> you know, it was just, it was kind of garbage. 
So I thought, oh my God, you know, maybe I'll just take one set of the panels and just call that an image and be done with it. But I put an Astral Pixel processor and turn on its multi-band blending and it, it did a lot smoother job. I mean, there's a lot of light pollution there, but those seams are, are greatly reduced. And when you find the final image, it's not bad. So, you know, it took this, this really, and most of my cases aren't this bad. This was like a failure case, but it took this failure case and actually didn't do too bad of a job with it. So really good stacking software goes a long ways. So how about narrowband imaging? So with narrowband, this is the other thing, you need really long exposures. And, and then I got the quote, now I'm sure exposures are gonna kill you for sure, you know, because you're, you're doing narrowband, okay? But let's check the math. Let's go back to that Robin Glover video. And, uh, and I'm not gonna go through the exact uh, math in this case, I'm gonna try to save a little bit of time. But essentially, if I, now that I've, I'm using this larger camera, I have the reducer on there, so my scope's f3.7, so I can use this starting number of 2.8 seconds. And I have a really low um, um, read noise. So the basic broadband math is that I need a 1.3 second exposure for a color camera or 0.45 second for a mono camera. So I'm starting really low, but now we're doing narrow band. Well, my narrow band filter is a 12 nanometer width filter. And so I need to multiply this by 25. And so that 4.45 seconds, it turns into 11 seconds. So I need to shoot an 11 second exposure to stay within 5% read noise. I'm not quite there, I'm at eight seconds. Maybe, maybe that sounds bad, but that means read noise adds only 7% total noise to the stack and sky noise is still 93%. So it's not perfect, but that's not bad considering with a narrow band filter that 93% of my noise in my stack is still just that sky noise, which is you're always gonna have. So let's look at my total stack noise in various situations. And by the way, all these backgrounds are shots I took. Um, so if I'm shooting at home with eight set exposures in Bortle seven skies, which are kind of suburban skies, here's what you look, see. The blue is the sky noise and that orange is the camera read noise, that camera read noise you're trying to avoid. Well, you can see that I'm fine with eight seconds. There's very little additional camera read noise on there. If I went to a five minute exposure, yes, you'd cut that camera read noise down even further and you'd be a little better, but it's not a huge deal. But let's talk about it. We add the narrow band filter. Narrow band filter cuts out 94% of the sky noise. So that sky noise comes down, bam. But I still have that read noise there. So it's starting to show up even at eight seconds. So it does add some noise, there's no doubt. A five minute exposure would be better. But you can see, going with the narrow band filter cut my sky noise down from way up there to the, down to this uh, you know, much smaller number. So I'm getting a huge advantage with that narrow band filter. There's no doubt it's a huge advantage, and it's immediate. And when I take even eight second exposures and put the narrow band filter on, I mean, the objects just show up right there. I mean, you can see them, it's, it's like magic. So it's a huge, huge thing, uh, even with short exposures. And what I left on the table by not doing long exposures is that difference there. And that's, you know, it's material, it, it matters. Go to a dark Bortle one sky location and it gets even, you know, the difference is even bigger. Uh, with ASAC exposures, you can see that read noise is starting to show up. And, uh, but I still gain a lot going to a dark sky location and I do leave some on the table now, there's no doubt. And if I have to cut that exposure down to six seconds or four seconds, cause maybe my tracking's terrible, then read noise can start to become 20, 30, 40% of my noise addition. So it can start to, to matter. So exposure time trade-off. There's these trade-offs between the shorter and longer exposures with using the Dobsonian. If I use longer exposures, I start getting elongated stars because the tracking's drifting. It's not that accurate. It's inconsistent, it's a little bit rough. So every once in a while, about every 10th frame will have a little jiggle in it or something. The field rotation in the shots, if the scope's pointing really high in the sky, you'll start to see it. And you generally, it's just a little bit softer image, just fewer details, just not as sharp. If I take short exposures, the problem is that your computer spends hours stacking, lots of data to store. You get those more read noise, so your, your, you know, your quality isn't gonna be quite as good. Generally, you get more details in a sharper image because your stars are just tighter, uh, but you get lower productivity too, because if you're taking a lot of short exposures, usually there's delay between shots, like about a second. So if you take four second exposures and you have a second delay, then you're only imaging, you know, 80% of the time, 20% of the time your, your, your camera's not doing anything. I found the happy medium for me is between four to eight seconds. Eight seconds is what I target. Um, 
And then in a pinch, if it's not guiding well, I might cut down to six. And then kind of the worst I have to, have to do is cut it down to four. Um, so that's kind of what this kind of technology, this kind of scope with this drive system that it has supports. Pausing for questions. Uh, nothing yet, Steve. So okay, good. Keep going. So what? So the game changer here really is low read noise cameras. I mean, it's been a common theme on this Astro Imaging Channel. Um, Jeff Prudeau, he talked about these robotic telescopes, you know, and that they basically are alt as telescopes. They do the same thing: short exposures. They integrate all together. They have to deal with field rotation. They just do it in a package that's you know all included. What's the key enabler? Modern low read noise cameras. Uh, Richard Wright talked about why guiding needs to die. You know, well, if someone kills guiding, guiding, what's the prime suspect? Modern low read noise cameras, you know. Um, uh, Don Talbot was talking about the latest generation of CMOS cameras. He went in great detail of what they do and why they enable, uh, you know, so much advancement in astrophotography. And it was the key feature he kept on talking about was the extreme low read noise of these cameras. And now I'm talking about how you can take it, this basic Dobsonian, which never was designed to do astrophotography at all. And as a, for a beginner, it can get decent beginner shots with it. And again, low read noise cameras. And then we look at things like our Samsung or your iPhone, you do the night mode, you hold it up and it sits there for five seconds taking lots of pictures. It's doing the exact same thing. It's taking lots of short exposures. It's aligning them, them it's combining them just like astrophotography. And it's enabled by low read noise cameras. So these, this is really enabling a lot of different things in astrophotography. And it's, I think it's just broadening the options we have. Uh, it'll take any system you have today and just make it better, but it also enables new uses. So people start asking me, you know, how do you do this? You know, with the details, because I'm going through kind of a rough outline. And I started writing these longer and longer responses to people. And so I decided to write it down in a document. But then one thing led to another. I'm pretty sure it's 130 pages. So I do have this guide. Well, I call it, it's not really a guide. It's really tips on how to do deep sky imaging with one of these go-to DOBs. Um, it's available on the Google Drive. We can put it in the show notes. And um, everything in this presentation is covered in a lot more details in the guide. Um, so it goes from just starting with planetary, what camera to select, you know, how to connect to NINA, what are the features of NINA, what, what does a script look like to drive one of these scopes and so forth. Uh, the things to, to watch out for. So what's the biggest issues I'm still running with? Uh, you can imagine my laptop is burning up from stacking. Uh, the computer processing and storage, as fast as computers are today, stacking four hours of 24 megapixel exposures, 3,600 subs, 160 gigabytes of data. Older computers just can't do it, basically. And it's slow even on fast computers. And then handling these rotating frames and you stack it into a larger frame, that even is more data. Like that's, that's harder. So you're doing a really hard job. So um, serial, astro pixel processor, and PI also use a lot of intermediate disk space. It can be 5 to 20x the original data size. So if you have 100 gigabytes of data, it might need 500 gigabytes or a terabyte of intermediate storage to, while it's doing its work. And so you just need these big, fast SSD drives just to have it do its work. So what's to the rescue? So two things, Moore's Law and Serial are coming to the rescue. So Moore's Law, big computer, fast computer helps. There's no doubt that the latest consumer models are significantly faster. Uh, my two-year-old gaming laptop, the latest ones that came out are about twice as fast. Um, the biggest drive I could get at the time was two terabyte Samsung uh, drive, and now you can get some four terabyte ones. So uh, there is, you know, Moore's Law isn't going as fast as it, it did maybe 20 years ago, but it is still advancing. And the latest mid-range systems are about 2x faster than my system. Astro Pixel processor um, is probably my ro most robust go-to solution, but it is slow. It takes one to two hours of stacking time for every one hour of shooting on this laptop. So if I go out and shoot four hours, I come back in in the morning, I get stacking. It's going to be done around noon to early afternoon. So it's going to take a long time. So if I want to go faster, I found that serial, the latest 1.2 beta, has improved features, has pretty darn good quality, and it's a very high performance. It's four to five times faster. It's about a half hour of stacking time for every hour of shooting. So it's pretty good. The quality isn't quite as good. Uh, and in some of the worst cases, I just have to go back to Astral Pixel Processor. Deep Sky Stacker is also a lot faster, but it's much lower quality results, and, and uh, it just didn't work for me. 
PixInsight is, is good. I mean, has wonderful feature for editing stuff, but when it comes to just stacking, it's 2x slower than APP. It does have good quality and it's better than uh, Cyril a little bit, but it's still a little bit lower quality than for rotating fields than APP. APP has um, that multi-band blending mode. It's just uh, Now, I'm not a PixInsight expert, I, I hopefully, maybe there's people will say, well, if you configure these modes in the exact way, you can get, you know, similar results. I haven't seen that yet, but that may be out there. But right now, if it's, my solution is this, I use Astro Pixel Processor 2.0 for the absolute peak quality and in complex cases. If I'm doing mosaics, I have some bad gradients. I have a large diffuse nebula that's very sensitive to gradients, then I'll just put it through there. That's just a go-to. If it's a simpler case, I'll use Serial. It's very good quality. It's really fast. And so if it's a planetary nebula where it's just a nebula in the middle and there's just stars around it, or it's a galaxy in a star field, bam, I can just put it in zero uh, and it'll do fine. So here's a, here's a kind of a summary. So you have no guiding, mediocre tracking. So the solution is short exposure. That pretty much solves it. Field rotation during exposure. Solution, once again, short exposures. Drifting off target because this thing doesn't have a guide scope. Nita solves it with plate solving. Fuel rotation over an entire imaging run. You use a high quality stacker like APP with multi-band blending. The short exposure read noise, modern cameras solve that. If you went back and went to a, um, an old CCD camera from 20 years ago, you know, the noise would be a huge issue in, in doing short exposures. But with modern cameras, less so of an issue. And then long stacking times, that's still an issue. There are solutions, serial staying fast and pretty good quality. The computers are getting a little bit faster. If your camera is a small pixel camera, just shoot in bin two, which is shoot lower resolution, because this scope, these Dobsonian scopes have a long focal length. They're really zoomed in. And so often your resolution is, you're seeing limited. You're not limited by your, your camera. So you can actually shoot the cameras quite often in lower resolution. And that, that saves a lot of time, obviously. And then, you know, if you're going to try to do something like mono imaging filter wheels, I certainly haven't tried it. I would think it's not a good fit. <laughs> First off, I think this DAW is good for just basic astrophotography. If you try to push it too far, I think, you know, you're just going to create a lot of work for minimal return. And one problem with something like a filter reel, I just want to bring this up specifically, is you want all these frames to be nicely aligned because you have, you're shooting different colors at different periods of time. With this DAW, with the poor tracking and the field rotation, you need all your color planes at the same time. <laughs> you know? So you need to use a color camera. Now, that being said, I have shot an image where I combined, um, a broadband and a dual narrow band, but I shot it in two different nights. I started the exact same situation, so I knew I was going to have kind of a similar result. But no, it, there's definitely limitations in this system. So, are there any advantages, though? I've talked about the disadvantages. I say there are some. I think if you already have one and want to dabble in AP, why not? I think you can start here and, and learn a lot, you know. And then if you buy a, a, a classic, you know, equatorial mounted rig later, that's fine. But you can start here. Um, it does have a big aperture and a low focal ratio, so it's pretty cost effective. It's a lot of photon gathering power for the money, to tell you the truth. And then I can dolly it out onto the yard on a piece of plywood and uh, do a two-star alignment. It's pretty darn easy, really, to set up and go. Uh, for me, it's a decent jack-of-all-trades scope. I can do deep sky observing. It's a wonderful scope. Dobsonians are wonderful deep sky uh, scopes. I can do nice electronic assisted astronomy sessions. I have people over, I have some friends over, and I just set it up and I just start doing it. And both those images were done in six minutes. So you get nice images in six minutes with, you know, it's great for gatherings and a party. Um, it does, it's pretty easy to do a good job on planets with them. You can do some uh, lunar and solar white light, and then you can do some deep sky stuff. So for me, it's kind of fun. It does a little bit of everything. Um, again, pausing for questions. A uh, couple of questions. I assume most everything that you're talking about would apply to any Altaz telescope. Right? Yes, I have a backup slide in there where I contacted people who are using like these little six, seven hundred dollar, and they use the same drivers. And it actually, turns out that you could connect them up also. Some of them don't have the hand controller, and they're only controller with Wi-Fi, so you need this ASCOM Wi-Fi driver. So I think there's maybe some, maybe some gaps in the software support. But you're right. Um, any scope that can basically track, in theory, could do some decent astrophotography if you put a low read noise camera in there. Well, I'm not thinking of a dedicated one, but simply something like a six-inch Celestron or eight-inch no, exactly. Celestron. 
Yeah, no, exactly. Things that, that a lot of people still have. Yes. But, yep. but uh, Stephen, they, they do have to be driven. Yes. Because you are tracking. Uh, you just aren't, um, um, you're, you're tracking in Altaz, whereas um, the traditional astroimager would be tracking in Equatorial. Yes. So, so what about these entry-level scopes? So like the Skywatcher Virtuoso GTI 150P is 400, about 470 bucks. It's a six inch F5 Newtonian. It's an alt and uses the same SynScan software. The guy on Dub Sodium Power does a lot of EAA with it. There's some cell phone apps, but he also connects a camera up to it. And it does have some driver support with ASCOM over Wi-Fi. And, uh, and you can increase the back focus by adjusting the extension tubes there. And so well, I was actually thinking about an SCT. Oh, okay, well that too. But here's some images that they're getting from this little cheap scope. So yes, mm -hmm. SCT also it has a very long focal length. I'd probably want to put a reducer on it yeah. because I, you know I know a Dobbs pretty long focal length. But boy, talk about long focal length! If you have an unreduced SCT, that's that even gives me the willies. <laughs> uh, another question. I think people are probably interested when you get your final setup. Uh, can I ask? What did it cost? Um, well, okay, so the telescope was, what it cost? The telescope was $1,700. Um, and then, you know, the planetary, when I just got the planetary, all I had was the camera and a used laptop. So the camera was 400 bucks. But I spent, I spent a lot right now. So I have an ASI 2600MC, that was 1800 bucks. I bought the uh, uh, Starzona Nexus, that was 449 I bought that dual band filter, that was 289 I think, or 239 um, I bought uh, Astro Pixel Processor, it was like 150 bucks. I bought the RC uh, Astro's uh, plugins. Those were like 50 bucks a pop. Oh, I spent twice as much. I probably, probably spent 3,500 bucks on uh, stuff to do astrophotography outside of just the telescope. And probably half that was that ASI 2600MC camera. Oh, um, yeah. oh uh, I just recently got an ASI 2400MC because I wanted to see, because I was playing with my daughter's full frame with the reducer, it worked pretty well. And I thought, I wonder how big a field of view I can get. So I splurged. And I, my my justification is I, I think I'm eventually going to get an equatorial rig if I can find a place to put it. But so, so I, I'm telling myself I'm going to use this stuff for long term. <laughs> so anyway, has others been successful? Here's images from other people. Um, some aren't as far along. And a lot of these are EAA images. Uh, up on the upper right is a guy who's integrating a little mini PC onto his DOB. So he has everything integrated there and he just remotes in now to it. So that's kind of cool. Um, but, you know, people are starting to kind of clue in that it can be done. And then I have a little bit on what camera size is best. So real quick, um, if you get too tiny a camera, like a little tiny sensor um, planetary camera, this one's a five by three millimeter then if you try to do something like this small hamburger galaxy, that's a pretty small galaxy. You can't even frame it. And the other thing is that it may be cheap and there may be no coma, no vignetting, you know, so forth. It's such a small sensor. But even one small galaxy doesn't fit. It may not be find enough stars to stack. You have trouble stacking when you don't, when you have such a small field of view. And the target drifts out of the field of view so fast and plate solving often doesn't work. So that's, that's red. I give that a red. I give this one a green. So a medium-sized planetary camera, like 11 by 6 millimeter, it's kind of a smallest I'd get. They're still fairly cheap, still a small sensor, so you're not, you don't have coma or vignette or some of the optical defects you see in a Newtonian. And a galaxy will fit. And usually you have plenty of stars to stack and it plate solves. This kind of works pretty well. An APS-C camera also works well. It's pretty big, but it's not so big that you start running into the real issues when uh, using it into a Newtonian, other than coma. You probably want to get a coma corrector for this. There's ones that are about 120 bucks that work pretty well. So, you know, you can buy more expensive ones, but uh, but you probably want to get one of those. But but in general, pretty well controlled, you know, still small enough sensor that's not causing big problems. By the time you get to a full frame camera, I'm giving that a yellow because, yes, look at all three of these galaxies in the Leo triplet fit. But this big sensor starts running into a lot of things. First off, it's very expensive if you don't have one already, especially if it's an astro camera. Lots of coma and noticeable vignetting. So you have to shoot really good flats. You definitely got to correct coma. And you get high sensitivity to any inaccuracy in your telescope, the, the collimation and how, you know, how flat the camera is and 
in, in when you set it into the um, focuser and so forth. Any kind of tilt or anything, you start to really see it. So everything's got to be perfect for it to look good. So that gets harder. And then if you go to the extreme, you put this and you put a reducer in there, you get this massive field of view. I mean, look at the, the galaxy spit. And, uh, but very sensitive. I have been doing some of this, though, playing with it and just seeing if, where it takes me. And, uh, but yeah, uh, that's, that's a bridge too far, I would say. And here's a flat frame from one of these cameras. So you can see, and the reducer, you can see the vignetting. So basically the telescope projects a circle, an image that's a circle, and the camera's a, a rectangular. And so this circle's trying to be, uh, <laughs> the, the frame is bigger than the circle. So you can see the outside edges are, are, are darkened because it's such a large, uh, large sensor. So my recap is, if you're gonna attempt this, learn to use the scope first. I think if you just get basic operation, know how to get good alignment, know how to locate some of your basic objects, you're kind of halfway there. Because if you know how to use the telescope, then putting a camera in there and taking a few pictures is not a huge leap. If you have a DLSR, that's a big money saver. Like I mentioned how expensive that APS-C camera was for Astro, 1800 bucks. I mean, the most, some of the most expensive things for astrophotography are the cameras, are the dedicated cameras, especially larger sensor ones. So if you have a DLSR, that's, that's a big deal. If you don't have a camera and you're thinking of an astro cam, I'd consider starting with one of these mid-range planetary cameras like the ASI 585 MC. And there's some other ones, you know, anywhere from about four to 600 bucks. They're big enough that you can use for planetary, lunar, solar, and deep sky. And I still use mine for planetary, lunar, and solar because they have such high frame rates. So they're always useful. So it's a great place to start. And then you can learn if you really want to be doing this. You can also consider just doing electronic assisted astronomy to start with. I kind of think of that as deep sky light because it's stacking right there in real time. You don't have to learn a lot of different software. And it's kind of, post, you kind of get immediate gratification. And I think it's a great way to learn some of the basics. Also doing lunar and planetary are easy and good first steps. If you are going to do your first deep sky attempt with the cameras, I would say, Make sure to find a small, bright target that you're good at locating already. And don't commit a long time on it. This, these gobs generate, gather a lot of photons quickly. So 20 minutes should get you a satisfying result as a first you know, image. And then if you have a really small pixel camera, uh, use it, shoot it in lower resolution mode. Uh, they call that bin two. Um, that'll save you a lot of heartache and a lot of time stacking. And finally, much of the magic is in the processing. When you see really good astro photos people posted, so much of that is in the processing. Here's an example. So often on, on cloudy nights, someone will post an image. They say, I took this image and I don't know, I can't get a good image. How do you guys do this? You know, here's a fine example someone posted. They were frustrated. So what happens, they, they upload the image and all these people on cloudy nights jump all over it. They start editing it. And of course, by that time, usually there's a dozen people that have edited it. And this is what it looked like afterwards. You know, this was just the editing of the photo. So it just shows how much. It's just a completely different class for people who know how to do um, the, 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 the image processing. So uh, you're gonna, no matter what telescope you use, you're gonna, to be a good astrophotographer, you're gonna learn a lot about image processing after, after you capture the data. How about the future of Dob imaging? You know, what, you know, for this type of scope? So, because for 25 years, the industry has been focused on equatorial mounts, polar alignment, guiding, everything to take a really long exposure, right? Because these cameras needed it. I think if just a small percentage of that effort was now put into improving something like alt as dob imaging, I think it could become pretty easy. There's been some recent introductions that have really helped. That Nexus reducer without the collar was a big deal. Nina has some new features and really improved performance for short exposures. Serial added some new features. They do full frame um, um, stacking where that if it's rotated frames, they will stack it into a larger picture. Uh, Astro Pixel Processor has gotten a lot faster in the last nine months that I've used it. There's general technology advancements. So sensor technology is pretty much good enough, but it's still, still continuing to improve. The latest cameras just came out from Sony like the, the SI-585 have some improvements. They're just better quantum efficiency, bigger well depth, lower noise. And then Moore's Law, I mean, computers are continuing. They're, they're, it's creeping along a little bit, but it's not going as fast as you stupid. Every couple of years, things are faster. SSD drives are bigger, so those will help. I think if I had my wish list of a few targeted solutions, I could think of two. One is, is that when Nina is calculating how that object has drifted with its plate solving, it knows exactly 
it could tell the mount, hey, you're going to the right, you know, five pixels every sec every 10 seconds and down one pixel every 10 seconds too much. And because it's consistent, the drift is consistent. But it should be able to tell the telescope to adjust its tracking so that, you know, it may not be like tracking when you use a, a, a star a, a scope that's still staring at a star, but it would be a lot better than just totally open loop right now with just the two star alignment. It could easily update the tracking and drift and be a lot more accurate. The other one is um, serial is super fast and almost good. As, it's as good as quality stacking as Pix Insight, I think, and almost as good as APP. If Pix Insight or APP could just get half as fast as serial, then that would be that would it'd be done. Also, if these all these programs could adopt a compressed data formats, so there are lossless compressed data formats that compress from two to three x that are available and they're they're hit and miss no one's gotten together and said hey why don't we agree on one and just all use it for you know fits files and so forth if they could do that and cut the data size by 2x then that would be helpful too closing thoughts um so technology advancements i think have give most any tracking telescope the potential to take decent astrophotos frankly uh sets alt as or on a wedge but even alt as but that low end telescope I show and these dobs. I think uh, that potential is there now. I, just a few gaps need to be closed. Refractors on an actuarial mount, they're still the best starting point. I'm not making an advertisement that this is where you want to start. I'm saying if you have one, it, it could be a good fun thing to play with. Um, you know, there's a lot of advantages of actuarial mount. It makes a lot of things easier. That is still the go-to system for if you don't have anything and you're just starting out. Uh, but if you do have a go-to dob with a suitable camera, give it a spin. See what it does for you. And if you are thinking of a telescope for both deep sky visual and basic astrophotography, I don't know, I think a go-to job may be worth considering. Uh, you know, instead of buying two scopes, you know, start with that and see what it does for you. And then if you keep on advancing in astrophotography, then you maybe do something. But if you want something for deep sky visual, a lot of those people get a job anyway. So just a thought. And then uh, for that, I have questions. And if there's no questions, I do have a couple of gallery photos I can show. Sure, why don't you show your photos, Steve? Okay, just a couple. Here's an example of mixing narrowband and broadband. I shot the horse head in Flame Nebula. This was uh, one hour of RGB and two hours of dual narrowband that I combined. So dual narrowband got, got the H-alpha data for me, the RGB got the, the stars, and there's some reflection nebula. Eight second exposures. And this one, I did use that ASI 2400 MC. I used that full frame camera with the reducer. So that was, that was the bridge too far, but AstroPixel processor does a heck of a job of stacking these. This one is actually a composite, the Leo triplet. You know, it's actually, they're all widely separated, but I just put them all close together here. Um, this is one hour of RGB and two hours of dual narrowband also. Oh, wait, uh, this one. Yes, this was, because I wanted to get a, a little bit more of H alpha in there. Four second exposures. Um, here's a, a big mosaic. And so this one I had, it was a very windy night. And, um, and so uh, I didn't get very high resolution, but I, I did a two by three mosaic and I only spent 12 minutes per panel. So only 12 minutes on each panel. And I was able to get the uh, um, M31. It was so rainy this, this winter that I didn't get another chance to go for it, unfortunately. And, uh, and so and it was really a poor scene. So it's not a great picture, but it was just, uh, it's just interesting that doing it uh, 12 minutes per panel, a two by three panel. Here's another two by two panel with one panel in the middle that I did for the Heart Nebula. Uh, this was the ASI 2600 MC, and this one was my longest integration, uh, seven hours total. Um, this one is a, condition, a com combination of lucky imaging and longer exposures. So I got the cat's eye nebula. I did lucky imaging in the, the center for its, that, that bright, high detailed center. I cut the core with one half second exposures. I did 17 minutes worth, and I stacked about half of them, threw away the ones that weren't as good and kept the lucky 50% that were good. And then for the outer dim nebulosity, I used uh, the, the narrowband filter and did two hours of 12 second exposures in that case. Now here's an example of a, uh, a reflection nebula caught in Bortle seven skies. So I'm in a light polluted skies um, and yet I shot this, this was seven hours, uh, but you can get some of these, uh, these uh, reflection nebula even in light polluted skies. And I think it's testament for the light collecting power of that, that telescope. Again, if it fits in the field of view, the field of view is smaller, but if it fits in the field of view, you can get some pretty decent images. Here's the comet uh, that, that came by about three months ago. 
60 minutes of exposures, uh, of six second exposures stacked here. Here's a video of the comet. Um, so here you can see two, several things going on. First off, the comet's moving across the sky, but my telescope's pointed at a fixed part of the sky star. So the comet will slide out of field of view. And then you can see the field rotating. So the camera looks like it's rotating. And you can see it also, uh, Mina adjusting it when it's sliding off track. So it's, it's kind, of, kind of a crazy video, but a lot of stuff going on there. But it's kind of fun to see the comet actually moving across the stars. And then uh, here's a dark sky example, um, four hours. This was Bortle Two Skies. It's a two by one mosaic. A um, couple more. I didn't have the coma corrector at the time. So um, some of these have uh, the stars aren't that good quality. Here's an example of what a planetary camera can do. Um, so even with that uh, ASI 183MC or the 585, with no filters, no coma corrector and from the backyard, you can get some decent shots of some of the smaller, smaller targets. All these are less than one hour imaging time. Um, this is low in the sky. This only rises like, like 25 degrees, I think, above the horizon over the city lights. So I was kind of happy to get this. It's over Portland city lights. It's like, am I ever going to get I, Eagle Nebula? It's classic, iconic nebula I wanted to get. So 45 minutes. Um, you get an okay picture. You know, I, I was just seeing those pillars of creation for me. I've always wanted to capture that. And even though it's so low in the sky, I had to go for it. And then here's an example where I had really short exposures. It was really windy this night. And so I, this was narrow band and I cut it down to four second exposures, if you can believe it. 2.3 hours on the Christmas tree nebula and cone nebula, Christmas tree cluster. So even with four second exposures, I can get an okay image. Triangulum galaxy, three hours. Um, this is a two by one rosette. And then here are example, these both were caught in with the moon out and with uh, that fire smoke. I could hardly see stars. I could just see the bright stars enough to align the telescope. And I thought it was an experiment. What would happen if I put that narrow bar filter and shot through the smoke? And I actually got images. It was amazing. Anyway, that's it. Thank you, everyone. If there are any more questions. Um. Thank you, Steve. You know, great presentation. I think I, we all are kind of a little bit surprised on the quality of the images from a Dobsonian. I think that's one of the takeaways. And they're probably, you have a pretty good audience and probably some people will be going back and saying, hey, maybe I could do that. Maybe I don't need that equatorial and refractor. I don't see any questions. Did you see there was I, one I that was a, deleted? I, I have a couple, Eric. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, Anaka wanted to ask the same thing about uh, D rotator. Let me ask about three things that I think uh, you've thought about, I'm sure. Um, why not add a guider? Mm -hmm. Why not put on a D rotator? Why not put on an equatorial platform? Very All good. three of those things would help. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. There's kind of a philosophical point is, if, am I going to, you know, I already spent a lot of money on camera, so I already kind of blew this philosophical point. But one of the beauties of this is that it's simplicity. Like, let's say you just stopped at, you had a DLSR and you stopped there and you got basic shots. Then that's a lot of bang for the buck. When you start adding more and more and you're trying to approach what an, a real good equatorial system can do, you may not quite get there, but you could end up spending more, I think. So I, I think there's this trade off, and I'm not sure. I, this is what I was thinking. First off, I was really thinking it'd be really important to get a nice rotator. If I had a rotator I could put in there that would, you know, take field rotation out, that'd be wonderful. Uh, there isn't any that are inexpensive that are available. I don't have a lot of back focus in my telescope to put one, so it's not really viable. So that's, but I can tell you, if they started designing these scopes with a little more back focus and someone came out like ZWO with a $200 derotator, I would be there in a second. Okay. Um, putting on an equatorial platform. So people will take a regular daub, even an unguided daub. They'll put it on a platform that can tilt and for one hour, it will track the sky. And then it goes too far and the telescope will tip too much and then they have to reset it. And there, I didn't show any of the pictures here, but they get great shots. As long as you're within an hour or you're willing to reset it, you can't have it automated all night long, but yes. And it takes care of field rotation and some of them have tracking and they're all ones that are kind of X and Y. They can actually move in two directions. Some of those are really expensive. You can get ones as cheap as around 400 bucks, I think. Um, and they, they work pretty good and they get some really good shots in an hour. And then, so that was two you mentioned. And the third, oh, guiding. 
I think that guiding could be done. Uh, someone mentioned they tried guiding. It has the interfaces, but there's a bug in the firmware, in the, the Alt-S firmware, where when you start sending its guiding pulses, it it, it interrupts the, the actual tracking. It's like, and it, they, they contact the company and they, they recognize it's a bug and they haven't fixed it yet. <laughs> so it could be, I think it, you know, it could be done in theory. It just uh, currently doesn't work. Steve, you can stop sharing if you'd like. Okay. Oh. Stop presenting. There we go. Anyway, yeah, yeah so it could be done. Uh, I just, uh, and so, yeah, I've thought about these things and, uh, but I, you know, if you got all that together, then, you know, I guess it, it's so basically cool. for the same oh. reason that John Dobson did not motorize the Dobsonian cannon mount. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, it doesn't look like we're getting any more questions, so it's going to be about time to wrap up for the evening. Um, next week, Russ Croman is going to come uh, get rid of a little bit of the noise and the blur and maybe remove some stars and shows us how, a little bit how artificial um, uh, intelligence helps him do all that stuff. Um, actually, I think he does have a particular topic, which is one of those things. I forget one. But anyway, he's going to tell us all about it. So we hope to see you back. And uh, by the way, we are just short of 15,000 subscribers, and we really would like to hit 15,000 subscribers in the next little while. So if you haven't thought about it, go ahead and subscribe on YouTube to the Astro Imaging channel. I want to thank uh, Steve for being here tonight. It was really fascinating, kind of like that when Richard Wright came on and said, uh, guiding's got to die. And I'm sure there'll be people saying, oh, poo poo, that will not work still after seeing that it does work. But thank you for coming on tonight and showing it all to us. Thank you very much. And I think Patrick's in charge tonight. So Patrick, could you take us out? All right, good night, everyone. Bye.